Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. So on the podcast today, we have two guests. We have Michael Arterberry, I hope I got that right, and Joni Strait. Yeah. Yay, I'm so terrible with names most people know. And we are going to discuss moving on after caregiving. Most listeners know that my mom passed away March 31st this year, 2020. So I'm going to have Michael introduce himself and give us a little background on him. And then Joni will go and then we'll take off running. Sounds good. Sounds good. So ladies, I got a story for you that helps introduce me um, to you and your audience. And it's about a farmer and a donkey. All right. And this donkey is one of his favorite farm animals, because once he finishes working with the donkey on the farm, he takes the donkey back home and he allows the donkey to play with his kids. So imagine he comes down the driveway, the kids, kids run out the house, they come over and they play with the donkey, they wash him, they ride him, and then he sends him back out into the farm. So one day he brings the donkey home, they come out, they play with him, they go inside to eat and get ready for dinner, but when he releases them out to the farm, the donkey wanders around and he ends up falling into an empty water well on the property. So when he falls into the empty water well, of course he can't get out. So the farmer, the next morning, comes out, whistles for him. He doesn't show up, so he starts walking around the farm and he's calling his name. He finally sees him at the bottom of the empty water well and he decides, of course, he wants to get him out. So he goes and gets six of his friends and brings them to the well. They look into the well and they decide that they're going to pull him out with some rope. So all six of them get rope and they start to lasso the donkey. They throw the rope down, they miss. They throw the rope down, they miss. They finally throw it by his hind legs. He steps into the rope. They shimmy it up his body and they start to pull. They pull the donkey moves. They pull the donkey moves. They pull the donkey moves. Then all of a sudden, halfway up, they realize that the donkey's too heavy. When they realize the donkey's too heavy, they lower him back to the bottom of the well, and now they have to make a grim, the farmer has to make a grim decision. Now, he can't feed him food at the bottom of the well because that wouldn't make any sense. He can't starve him because if he starves him, he's more like a pet. He really doesn't want to starve him. One of his hot-headed friends was like, hey, just shoot him. He's like, no. I can't do that. So one of his more reasonable friends whispered in his ear and said, listen, you don't want your kids to fall into the well. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover him with dirt. You're going to sacrifice your donkey, but your kids will be safe. And the farmer could deal with that. So they all get shovels and they start shoveling the dirt. And every time that dirt would hit the donkey, the donkey would scream. And every time he would scream, it would cause the farmer some distress. So you got dirt, scream, dirt, scream, dirt, scream. The next thing you know, the scream stop. When the scream stop, they give the donkey a moment of silence. But then they go back to work. More dirt, more dirt, more dirt, more dirt. The next thing you know, you see the donkey's right ear. So they start shoveling cartoon style. The next thing you know, you see half the donkey's body. They shovel a little faster. And the next thing you know, that donkey walks right out of the well that he fell into. Now listen, ladies, this is how he saved himself. Every time that dirt came across the wall, it would fall on his back, he would shake it off, and he would step on it. And he took every scoop of dirt that was meant to kill him to save his life. And now I tell you that story because I am the donkey. I grew up in a home with a raging alcoholic father mm. who raged from the time I was born and to the day he died when I was 16. Now, what does that mean? That means that every day of my life until he died, any time I got caught up in having fun, something would tap me on my shoulder and say, hey, buddy, don't you get too happy because you got to go back home to that house. On top of that, I grew up in a home with poverty. Now, both my parents worked full time. My dad was a bus driver. My mother uh, was a housekeeper. So she cleaned homes. His money went to the drinking. My mother raised four kids with a housekeeping salary. So I grew up in poverty. 
to finish it off, dysfunction. Now, if you got a father who's an alcoholic, I got three siblings that are being raised by the same man. They're trying to instill values in me, but they're getting the values from him. So I lived in this dysfunctional family. My neighborhood had the same thing because all their families were the same. Now, what makes me, I think, powerful in my gift is that I took all of that. My wounds, my scars, and that is what pushes me to help others. I was able to come through all of that, and I'm now a successful motivational speaker. I have my own nonprofit working with youth, and and that's why I'm happy to be here to listen to you pretty ladies' stories <laughs> so I can help you out. So I hope I didn't take too long, Jennifer. No, that's good. So let's have Joni introduce herself and kind of talk about where she's at in life right now because she's having a 2020 year. It is a 2020 year. I don't know if I can top a donkey story, though. <laughs> um, that was really good. Uh, my name is Joni, and I, um, I'm going to say my age, even though it's kind of weird, but I, I just feel like I'm really young to be going through all of this. I'm 42. Um, I am the middle child of five siblings. Um, my dad was diagnosed in around 2010, 2011 with Alzheimer's. Um, and very soon after my mom was as well, I, it's, it was within six, eight months. It just kind of depends how you want to look at, I think dad was showing signs much longer and mom was able to hide it. Um, so I am the middle child. It kind of just because of the nature of finances and my own flexible work schedule, I'm also a photographer, um, the duty kind of fell to me um, to take care of them. And I say fell to me because I did not embrace it um, at the beginning. And my story is one of grace and redemption and, you know, being able to forgive a lot of hurts. I didn't have the most ideal upbringing. Um, it was just, a, it was complicated. I will leave it at that for now. Um, but I, I watched that journey with my mom and dad through their Alzheimer's, you know, eight, nine years. Um, I cared for them in their home for several of those years. In 2015, I had to seek nursing home placement, um, because it's one thing to have one person with Alzheimer's. It's quite another to have two. There was literally no way I could bring them into my home, which I do feel somewhat guilty about. I wish I could have done that. There's just no way. Um, so I had them in a room together um, at a wonderful facility that was three minutes from my home. And, you know, my visits with them varied here and there. But, um, you know, the, the short part of the story is my dad passed away in May of 2018. And then my mom died on May 2nd of this year. Um, I was honored to be with my mom when she died and, and I, you know, walked her home and it was everything I needed it to be for me to kind of culminate this whole journey. Um, and the same with my dad. I wasn't there at that exact moment, but I had been there with him, you know, for about 10 days straight and made the decision to, to step away. So where I find myself now is, you know, I, w I still was able to work my photography business through that time but I didn't put my whole heart into it because I knew that at any given moment, that role was going to become the very top priority as mom and dad's caregiver, whether it was while they were at home, which was a huge deal, but also in the nursing home. They, I, I needed to visit. I needed to help them with meals. And, you know, just because you, you know, put your loved one in a nursing home does not mean your role is over. And I feel like there's a lot of families who are, who, who view it that way. Um, so I did kind of, um, I could talk all day about this part, but you know, I, I lost that role. The, 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 the moment my mom passed away, that role ended for me, that caregiver role that had defined and shaped such, I don't know, formative years of my life. I say that like I'm a teenager, but that's not what I mean. I, it, it was just, you know, my motherhood journey. I have two children. They're wonderful you know, they're 19 and almost 16. Like my motherhood journey is kind of coming to a close. You know, my, it, my photography business now, I'm trying to kind of regain my footing a little bit, which is wonderful. Um, but that role 
of being their person and going to the nursing home every single day is gone. And so that's why I'm here because I feel like I don't know who I am now. I don't know who I'm supposed to be. I have a million really good feelings about it and a, and a lot of thoughts and a lot of hopes and dreams for things I can do to help make a difference. Um, but there are days where grief kicks in and I just feel lost. So that's my story <laughs> in a very short amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're a little bit more similar. I had a challenge, not well, challenging childhood. I mean, I had a typical middle class upbringing. My mom stayed home with my sister and I. My dad worked. He had a side job, which is where the photography came in. That's what he did on the side. So we have my some, dad did too. Oh Lord, <laughs> I know. <laughs> We're like, <laughs> it's funny because lives. yeah. Well, my sister's got dark hair, olive complexion. Most people, when you look at the two of us, wouldn't know we're related until we point out the similarity, and then it's like, oh yeah, duh. And oh. she, she and I do not see the world at all the same. Don't know how that happened. But I'm Perfect. like thinking, I'm looking at you going, man, we're like, it's like, she's my lost sister. <laughs> so my story is a little shorter because I've told it a lot in the past few months on the podcast here. But I'm going to backtrack. I started this podcast because after my dad died, which was March 2nd, 2017, I was trying to find ways to connect and engage with my mom that were a whole lot better than her asking me literally every two minutes. So what have you been up to lately? So what have you been up to lately? I mean, it's like, I remember sitting with her thinking, I think some people can have a better conversation with a parrot. This is horrible. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is my mother. That was a horrible thing to think. So, you know, I always had that like internal argument with myself, which is always fun. And so I would read books and do internet research until my eyes were blurry and I'm a reader and there's, some of these Alzheimer's books, it's like, I can only read like three or four pages and I gotta like put it aside and like, okay, it's enough of that. Um, just a little quick plug to the Alls authors. They have tons of books that are a lot easier to read. They're like written by people like Joni and I, even Michael to some respects, although it is Alzheimer's related. So one day I'm driving to the gym and I'm listening to my On the Way to the Gym podcast, which literally was eight to 12 minutes and it took about nine to 11 minutes to get to the gym back in those days when we could actually do that. And I thought, duh, why am I not like, I need to go find a podcast on for Alzheimer's caregivers. So when I got home, I went and cause I'm 53. So I had to actually be able to see it lit big on a screen, not on my little phone. Mm -hmm. I looked and there literally was one and it, it wasn't my flavor. It didn't speak to me. It just, it wasn't what I needed. She's been around a long time. She does a really good job, but it just, you know, there it, I'm a chocolate person. That was a vanilla podcast or however you want to look at it. It's not a criticism. <laughs> and the on the way to the gym podcast actually yeah. had a ser um, a bonus episode on starting your own podcast. I was like, I can do that. <laughs> so that's how I started the podcast. And initially it was to impart the wisdom that I had learned. And that's air quotes for people that aren't watching the YouTube video that I'd learned over the journey with my mom over the last 15 to 20 ish years. It wasn't quite 20 years at that point. And it wasn't until probably this time last year, this is August 20th right now when we're recording that I started actually taking a step back and going, what is the podcast going to look like when mom is gone? And I, I'm a huge planner. And so that was, a, that is the one way I think I was able to move forward a little bit better because I'd thought about it. And I honestly, and I still believe this. I honestly think my mom had two or three more years. I think so that's, um, she, she started getting really super combative in May of 2019 and I was constantly researching, talking to guests about what do you do? I mean, like she literally scratched caregivers, drew blood. And I mean, I was just appalled because I'm like, first off, yikes, it's my mom. And that's not how she would have behaved. And, you know, and I didn't want the caregivers getting clawed. It was not, not a pretty thing. So I was constantly searching for 
a solution. And I felt like I was literally chasing water down a drain because I was behind the curve. She was ahead of me. And it just, we never, we never managed to find a solution. And I am convinced that the reason she fell and broke her leg is because she was not cooperating with the caregivers. They had showered her. I mean, it took two people to shower a 106 pound woman. And they said that she reached for her clothes and slipped and I'm thinking she actually jerked away from them and snatched at her clothes because you don't just turn and slip. I mean, you got to be a real klutz for that. And she was very, very mobile. So, of course, that all started at the beginning of the pandemic. She ended up in the hospital on March 8th. I saw her the 12th, the 14th, and the 16th. And then her care home was like, we don't know what the heck's going on. No guests. And I was like, mm, not too cool with this, but I had called in hospice because the company that I wanted to do palliative care for her was, I think all the hospital hospice companies are just overwhelmed right now because everybody I've talked to has had a horrible experience this year. So I'm hoping <laughs> that that gets fixed because that's, hospice is a wonderful thing generally. And yeah, you know, so she had the caregivers and the hospice nurses and everybody was keeping me up to date. But I literally stayed in my house. It was easy. It was raining in California. So it's like, meh, <laughs> like today with the fires, it's like, yeah, I'll stay in and, and, and do whatever. And, you know, and next week I'm going to storm the gates. And it was two weeks. They called me and said, mom's not doing really well. We think she'd do benefit from a visit from you. I went, the hospice nurse was there. I took one look at my mom and went, nope, we are not going out in the wheelchair and visiting kids this spring or summer. And she died the next day. So I did get to see her. I was not one of those people whose family member died without them. My sister and my niece got to see her. So that was all good. There was 10 of us that ended up outside her room the day she died, much to the chagrin of the <laughs> executive director of the community. So, you know, they were really, really good. And it hit me really hard because I had told people I'm ready for her journey to be over. This is horrible. This is horrible for her. This is horrible. I mean, my sister's four and a half years younger. My daughter's almost 29. My niece is almost 15. My nephew is 10. So it's like my daughter got all the good years and she just couldn't deal with seeing her grandmother this way. So it's like, I, I kept telling people I'm ready. I'm ready for her to go. This is just terrible. And then it happened and I was like, I guess I wasn't ready. I mean, I was like shocked. And that's, you know, then I had to like put a pause on the podcast. I had a whole bunch of episodes recorded because I couldn't listen to myself talk to people about her in the present tense when I knew she was gone. So I recorded a whole bunch of other podcasts. <laughs> now my queue is really full. <laughs> so my moving forward is I just made the decision to be a caregiver to caregivers and I've expanded what I'm doing and hopefully post COVID I can expand it a little bit more, but I don't think I would have been able to do that had I not actually spent a considerable amount of days, parts of every day thinking, what's the podcast going to be like when she's gone? Which was a good thing because I didn't seriously suspect that that would happen within a year. So that's my story. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's been, wow. well, that's, I could go on too, because we also sold our forever home and we moved and we now we're renters after 22 years. And we did all the financial things that were smart with selling the giant house that we could barely afford. And now we're in a position to buy a new house and we're just sitting here waiting for the world to get back to normal. It's just been a year, you know? Yeah. <laughs> 2020 do not recommend <laughs> and i want to i want to add a little bit you reminded me jennifer because you know i think when you walk that journey with with your loved one or your parents like i did like there were days and i i was i'm right there with you where i'm like oh my gosh like i'm ready for this to be over because this is not fair to them like mm. this is this is hard and this is sad and they wouldn't want to be like this you know they yeah. i know that i i still stand by that but gosh you are never ready 
as much as you think. I, just, I have goosebumps thinking about just how not ready I am still. And it's been, you know, almost three months to let go of her. Um, and I think that that grief and relief walk hand in hand in the journey that we're in. It, and it's it's really hard because it, sometimes you feel guilty because I'm like, I'm starting to kind of get my, my legs back a bit where I'm like, okay, you know, I can do this now. And I don't have to, I don't have to schedule my day around the time in the nursing home or whatever. And then the guilt just hits me because that relief was so strong. I think that's a really important factor in the moving forward part because you're you're gonna have the relief, but you you still gotta get through the grief part. So help us, Michael. Yeah. Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> so so let me let me do this. Let me start with you, Joni. Um, if 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 you could lay out perfectly, if I could set it up and you leave this podcast right, and I can give you the golden ticket, what would it be? Uh. The golden ticket would be if I walked away having a very clear-cut plan for how I can take this experience that I have just gone through for all this time and the knowledge and wisdom I've gained from it and put it into a nice little package wrapped in a pretty little bow that I can share with people and, and help them too. That would be, that's that's what I, I, I'm feeling that, I feel torn because there's the living my life and then there's the also still being a part of the, the Alzheimer's community. I have an Instagram following that's pretty significant on it, all about my parents and that's been wonderful. But like Jennifer, I'm like, Oh my gosh, what happens to this now? You know, and there's a lot of people who want to hear from me and I just, I don't know where to go with what I know. Okay. All right. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yep. And I'm going to, Talk to Joni for a bit, and then we'll come to you, Jennifer. How does that sound? Oh, that's perfect. Right, right. So so when you say you want to pass on to others what you've experienced, um, as you were going through it, were you communicating with people? Were people watching you do what you were doing? Constantly. Right, right, right. Do, do you see that right there in itself? We sometimes complicate the simplicity of things. You are talking about the influence of what you were doing as far as now after the fact, but the influence was actually happening in the middle of the work. Mm -hmm. People were watching you. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? People were watching you. You know, and what you did is you sidestepped some specifics about your childhood. Now, I work with teenagers. I'm not going to take you down that road, so don't, don't get nervous. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't, don't turn red on me and get nervous. I'm not going to take you down that road. No. But let me tell you something. When you talk about a blessing in, the, in disguise, when your parents are going through what they were going through, don't you know you were able to create whatever fantasy you wanted to as far as the family that you wanted to have growing up? Mm -hmm. That mother and father became whatever your brain wanted it to be when you were a child. Mm. You see? Yeah. And so, and so what both of you, and you can take advice from this, Jennifer, is what we have a tendency to do is to go through something so big that we try to swallow it at once. And it overwhelms us. So, you know, sometimes I use the analogy of, of when people look at life and they do that, I use it, the analogy of a pizza pie. And when you, when you try to eat an entire pie at once, you get a stomachache. So if you eat one slice at a time, you enjoy the pizza and you enjoy that you're having it. You've gone through something that was huge. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to eat the whole pizza, Joni. And you got a bellyache. Yeah, you got a bellyache. You know, sometimes we have to learn to push away from the table. You take some in. You digest a little bit. You push from the table. 
and you come back and eat again when you're ready. You know what I mean? I took I took some notes, um, and in the midst of that, not only could you create the perfect family, but in the midst of that teenage upbringing, you lost part of yourself. So you walk into this caregiver position in a position where you had no identity and now one was created. You see what I'm saying? And and so I'm, I'm telling you this because so many times when we think the clouds are so dark, there's sunshine shining through. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was it was it was shining through. That lost little girl now had value. When you showed up to take care of them, you you had value. Somebody needed to see you. And if they didn't, they couldn't get what they needed to get. No. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. so we have to be careful of how we we process that. You know what I mean? Um chosen and a lot of this stuff that I'm saying, Jennifer, you know, it, it, it goes for the both of you so that I don't have to repeat it because your stories are so similar. But but chosen, you both m- mentioned siblings. Now, I'm not getting into the whole sibling thing, but I'm just, I just want to drop something out there. I had, I have, I don't want to freak you guys out, but I'm, I'm a spiritual guy. And so in my spiritual time this morning, I, I brought you guys in there with me. And you know, you know what I saw in my spiritual time, guys? I saw a line of people, so we can call them your siblings or whatever, and each one of you were pointed at. Somebody picked you. They chose you. So if you're talking about siblings, think about it. This person that picked you saw your siblings, didn't go to one of your siblings, they came to you. And I say that because you have to understand that sometimes we end up going through things Because we have what it takes to get it done. Where the other people standing in that line didn't have it. Mm -mm. So you got picked. That's a privilege. You know what I'm saying? You don't walk from this and feel like you, 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 I wouldn't say curse, that's too deep. It cuts too, but I'm saying you don't want to walk away from it being like, why me? You walk away from it saying, you know, this was this was an honor. I'm sorry, I'm rambling on. I see you want to say something. No, I, I completely agree because I feel like at the beginning of my journey of caring for them, it I felt like I was dragging my feet. And I don't know, I cannot honestly pinpoint what made the switch for me. We're going to just call it a miracle because, you know, I think I started seeing my parents as human you know you cannot help a dementia person in some of the things you need to help with and not see humanity right in front of you and the need for tenderness and the need for for love and compassion and empathy and all those things and i just feel like you know my maturity kicked in a little bit i was able to let go of some of the things i had held on to from my childhood and suddenly in front of me you know my 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 dad needs help shaving and my mom needs help with a shower and oh my gosh how can you be mad at someone like that because they were doing the best they could when i was a kid you know they did what they thought was right and that's fine so i feel like that shift did happen very organically and and, and it probably honestly just the right time so that I didn't have a breakdown in the middle of all of it. And then it did become the greatest honor of my life besides mothering my children was, was walking that path with them. And, you know, I I don't feel the why me, I I don't, I, I'm glad it was me. I think that's why losing that identity and that role, it's a separate kind of grief just from losing my actual individual parents it's a role that I cherished, you know, especially over time. So I, I'm very thankful that I don't feel the why me part of it because that's really hard to swallow. You know, instead, I, I am able to look at it with gratitude for the, the path. It doesn't mean it was without sacrifice. Like there were a lot of things, you know, my, my kids were used to me not being around a lot because at that time, 
grandma and granddad came before they did some days. Like it, it just, it, it's, you have to do that sometimes. And they were gracious and understanding, thank goodness. But it was an honor, period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's an honor. And, um, you know, something else you can take from it is, Again, from a spiritual side, and I don't want to flood this with spirituality, but I have to, I, that's what I'm kind of, that's where I come from, mm -hmm. you know. But I, I, I say this to you because our manufacturer is so savvy in the way that he helps us. Because imagine the magnitude of what he was able to do to you in your life with two different time periods. He was, he was, I mean, he was moving and shaking, Joni. He was, he was taking care of the teenage girl, but at the same time feeding the adult woman. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, and, and, and one thing I want both of you to understand is that there's no time limit on grief. You say, you know, so you you sitting at your house and you wake up one morning. Every morning you wake up and you say, "When is this thing gonna get better? When is this thing gonna get better?" Stop doing that. Take take the time limit off the table. You know, because I tell you, there may never be a day that you wake up and don't feel it. You know what happens when you speak to people about it is that it gets to a level where it's manageable. But there may not be a day that you're going to have in your life that you're not going to feel it. And so you have to deal with the, with, with the reality of that. You know, Jennifer, for you, when you talk about a way to deal with the grief, you know, again, talking about the manufacturer, he was so savvy with you. He created the podcast in advance. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You know, you, you're, you're talking about what what am I going to do with the podcast once she leaves? He, he was ahead of you. Because imagine if you didn't have the podcast once she passed. Woo! Sitting in your house, you're talking about you don't like to leave the house? Imagine if you didn't have a podcast as a distraction to bring your mind to a different place after the loss of your mother. You'd be going out of your mind. Yep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so what, what I'm big on for both of you ladies is, is rather than when we get into the position where things begin to get heavy, you know, it, do you, you guys, any football, you, do you know anything about football? I mean, you don't have to know much about the analogy I'm about to use. But yeah. I, I was a football player. I coached football and I coached running backs. Those are the guys that run the ball and they get tackled. What I teach my players, I was a running back myself, is when you feel pressure as a running back, as soon as you feel pressure, you chop your legs. You chop your legs because you feel the pressure, and when you chop your legs, you're able to maneuver past the tackle. What I need you ladies to do is when you start to feel the pressure of life coming on you, you have to revisit some of these places that I'm talking to you about right now. When grief gets heavy, Joni, you got to think about the fact that you, you got to have your, your fantasy parents. When grief gets heavy, you got to think about the fact that the childhood that could have marked you for being a statistic you were able to find a silver lining. There's young people out there that I work with that if they don't have a, 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 an occurring event like what happened to you, they have to take that with them for the rest of their lives. You were able to find or make sense of something that is so complicated. And you want to know something? Let me tell you something. Those two kids that watched you grind like that? Oh, my gosh. Do you know the lessons that you taught them, Joni? Yeah. We can't teach our kids that stuff. 
Matter of fact, we don't want to teach them that stuff. No. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, you don't want to. No. But, but, but again, to watch their mother step up to the plate and swing the bat like that, there's not a university, there's not a job, there's not a husband, there's not a wife, whatever sex they may be, that can teach them the perseverance that you taught your kids in that struggle. I know my daughter, sorry, my daughter always, she's helped support me, and she always said, I don't know how you do it. I'm like, I don't know how I do it either, I just do. And I think I had a, a slight aha moment. Despite being the youngest of my peer group growing up, I was always the one that people came to for advice, which I never understood. Like, what the hell? You guys are older than me. Which I know in school is not a huge difference. And I know one of the things that I kind of felt as an additional loss was not, not participating in what was going on in her care home. And I realized while Joni was talking that it's like I was part of a team of caregiving. I would help them. They would help me. We would all help my mom. And it's like, that's gone too. And it's like, I do have plans to go back. I've talked about taking my youngest dog. He likes to go visit the old ladies he, and they love him. So <laughs> it's a really good thing. Um, so when, when that's an option, we're going to go back and, you know, be a new part of that team, even though she's gone. But I didn't realize that there, I mean, I knew that I was missing those people, but I didn't realize like there was like a loss of being part of that team right now. So it's, I had a little, you know, I, I want to add to that, um, Jennifer, because you know, that those people, especially with, you know, family dynamics, not always being ideal. Um, they became my family. They're the people I saw every day. They're the people that I spent Christmas day with and Thanksgiving day with, because there was no way I wasn't going to go be with my mom on those days when she's literally right there, you know, nearby. But one thing that I, I mean, I anticipated missing that role, but I didn't anticipate the fact that because of the pandemic and the stress that all of these essential workers have been under a lot of them, that, like our nursing home lost a lot of people. Uh, like a, a lot of residents died from COVID. And so what I have been hearing lately is a lot of the staff have moved on to other jobs because it's too painful to be there. So I'm like, even when that day comes when I can go back in, you know, and give everybody hugs and see all my people, all my people aren't going to be there. It's never going to be the same. And that's just one of those secondary losses that you don't even think about in the moment never crossed my mind until the first one told me, Hey, I just want to let you know, I'm taking a job here. And I'm just like, Oh my goodness. Like this is, and then it just kept happening more and more. So, you know, you do become a team with these people who care so intimately for your loved one. And I, I wouldn't trade it for the world, but gosh, I would love to go back for one more day and just have everything be the exact same, you know, residents included. Can I, can I say something to that Joni? Yes. Listen, I'm, and I'm going to use, I like to tell stories. They say I'm a good storyteller, so I'm going to tell yeah. you a little story. But I want to imagine, both of you to imagine being out. It could be a lake. It, nah, let's not do a lake. It has to be open water. Let's do open water in a, in, a, in a sailboat. And a storm comes. The storm toss and turns your boat. And by the time you get to the shore, you only have pieces of your boat, but you made it. You made it to the shore with pieces of your boat. You were only supposed to make it to the shore with the pieces, not the entire boat. Those people that left where your parents were were pieces of the boat. So you got to let them go, like going out into the ocean. Yeah. They were only there to get you through that time period. What you have left once you reach the shore is what you're supposed to have. It's and still that's sad, Michael. What? <laughs> I said it's still sad. Oh, yeah, it is. It is. But <laughs> you know what? It. Yeah, yeah. It's sad. It's And I'm not taking away the sadness, but you, I know. you're able to grab it and articulate it. But right. there's so many people 
that are not able to compartmentalize it and separate themselves, right. that they will lose, the, lose themselves and that hurt that they feel yeah. of the loss of the pieces rather than being happy with, with, with what they have left. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Um, and with you, Jennifer, you found your place. You know, if those people were really uh, accepting of you and you found a place and, and a place that's that's like home. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's 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 terrible that life has to create situations to make us feel like we're at home. You know what I'm saying? When I look back over my life and I explain to you the way my life started, and I mean that you're talking about dirt. We, we like you. We don't have to get into my childhood. Right. I only gave you three things. I could have went on for an entire podcast. <laughs> you know, and and when I look at it, I say to myself that if I didn't go through those things, I couldn't do what I do today. You know what I'm saying? So there's never a time where I sit back and I feel victimized or the victim. You know, it had to happen. There was a reason for it to happen. And when you grab purpose out of the grief, out of the things that we go through, it brings value rather than looking at it as something that, that, that's causing that pain. What can I use from this? Yeah to say that, yo, you know, I, I needed this. I needed I needed to go through this. And I'm telling you, just looking at you, you're a different woman because of what you went through. 100%. Different. Yeah, you are. You yeah. are. You didn't like it. <laughs> no. It didn't feel good. No. no. And it didn't feel good. It didn't feel good. But you, you are a different woman. You know what I'm saying? And so... You you say to yourself, "Hey, it was rough. It was it was tough, but I am on this day a different woman because of what I was able to endure." You know what I'm saying? And when you talk about moving forward, that's the gift. Now, what you have to be careful of, and I'm hoping I'm not getting too winded, is that if you if you allow some of the remnants of the old Joni, to creep while you're moving into the new Joni, mm-hmm. you steal. You steal from your progress. Yeah. You take it away. Right. So we have to live for today, not for tomorrow, and not for yesterday. Because if we're not careful, we don't get to enjoy the moment. You know. I'll finish with this. You'll start worrying, and I had to get this in my own brain. You start worrying about things that don't need to be worried about, and then when they come and they don't happen, you just lost 20 days, 10 days worrying about it, and now you're like, what the heck? I mean, I, I, when I finally got to the conclusion and realized that, mm-hmm. I, I mean, it really would kill me. You know, like I didn't like going to the dentist, right? So I would, I would be in that dentist chair every day until the day I went into the dentist's office out of fear. I go in... <laughs> The, the, the dentist appointment is an hour, and when it's over, I'm like, what? <laughs> I just suffered 20 days before I got here for this? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's it's crazy. It's crazy, but we have to be really careful, you know? We're products of our thought lives. So yeah. when that brain starts to run and go places, you got to grab it and say, come here. Let's get back <laughs> over here, and <laughs> let's 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 do this thing. From a different place. I like the visualization of a brain on a leash. <laughs> yeah. 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 It makes a lot of sense. I I find that the the caregivers where mom lived, we had we ended up with a relationship that I felt was kind of like siblings because they like one gal would she was from africa and she would say your mama need this or your mama need that and i'd be like you couldn't call me before i drove over here <laughs> now i gotta go and then i gotta come back and oh you make me crazy and she'd just laugh at me and i'm like whatever you know it's it's fine <laughs> and then for whatever reason the beginning of this year 
they started making baking cookies on the memory care side of the community. And I'd walk in and, you know, over the last three years, like uh, you guys probably haven't heard too many past episodes, but I lost a hundred pounds, but over the last three years, it's trying to creep up again. It's very frustrating. So I'm working on it and I would walk in and I'm like, what the hell? Why are you guys baking cookies? You're killing me. How am I supposed to avoid cookies when the whole place smells like chocolate chip cookies? And I could harass them and tease them. And, and it was just, it was a really, it was, it was like a family relationship. And I didn't really realize that until we were talking. I mean, I kind of knew it, but I, I, like the light bulb came on a little brighter with this conversation. And one of the things that, I think helped me is starting the podcast. That was one of the ways was, it was kind of a way to, I think, get over my dad. Um, my dad, my grandfather, my dad's dad, my dad, my husband and I are all Rotarians. So service to other people is in our blood and doing the podcast somehow incorporates into that. And I learned so much over the last two and a half years that it helped my mom. So I'm like, I helped myself by doing this, you know, it's like it's a good thing because I don't make any money doing this just yet, but it's like, it's, it's been a blessing for me and I have met some of the most incredible people. And so there's two things you could do with your knowledge. Joni is if you're not already an advocate with the Alzheimer's association, do that. Cause I don't know about your state chapter, but my area chapter is so cool. They're so much fun. And they've done a lot of meetings and stuff online. So it's been kind of beneficial to stay connected that way. And then, you know, there's over 200 Alls authors. They add new authors every month. You know, I could hook you up with a whole bunch of them if you want to talk about writing a book. Because yeah. I have found more caregivers create something from their experience. I created a podcast. Lots of people do blogs and books. There's other things with music and technology and it's just, it blows my mind because when I started the podcast, I'm like, why is there no like services or help? Like, what the heck? This is like really hard and there's like no services. And then I got to the Alzheimer's Association, my first um, caregiver support group. And it was like the floodgates of people and knowledge and support and services. Just, it was wonderful. So I am still an advocate. I actually have an advocate meeting, I think next week. And it's our team planning meeting for our state rep not state representative, our, our representative in Congress. So it's like, oh yay, let's talk politics. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have I have something that I want you to do. You both you can do that's concrete. And you can do it once we get off the podcast. Um and you mentioned, Joni, that you feel like now that they're gone, you're, you know, you're struggling a little bit with the, the identity. I do an activity which I call Who Am I? So the both of you are going to take 10 slips of paper. You know, they can be about, you know, a little bit bigger than the yellow tag papers that you put up. But what I want you to do is I want you to think and write 10 words, either good or bad, that describe who you are. Be totally honest. <laughs> totally honest. Nobody obviously will see them but you. Once you write the 10 words, I want you to stack them in priority order. Put them on a table in front of you and list them from least important to the most important. All right? Once you get them in that order, I want you to flip them over. All right? It should be the least important on top, if not rearrange it if I didn't tell you correctly. Mm -hmm. So you want to start with the least to the most. And I want you to look at each word and see how that word represents or is represented in your life. Give each word a minute or so. Reflect on it. Crumble up each word once you're done. When you get to the, the one that's your top word. Once you've completed, all 10 papers are crumbled up in front of you. You go back and pick the ones you want to keep. The ones you don't want to keep, you get rid of. And you start moving forward. You start moving forward. You'll get a nice gauge of who Joni and Jennifer are 
and the show is moving forward, now you have some substance. And, you know, this is the direction. This is who I am. And this is, you know, where I would like to go. So, you know, just a little something that I could give you that's concrete yes. so that you can take with you um, once once this thing is, is completed. Thank you. Yeah. That's an interesting exercise. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I I I run a um I run a program that I do with adults and and students. It's called Power of Peace. And it's uh in the in the schools it's two full days and um all interactive and all the activities are are interactive and based sort of like just similar to that, and I call that activity Who Am I? And what my workshop is about is that I believe, and you, you, you guys will understand this completely from what we've talked about already, is that we go through life and we step on landmines, but the landmine doesn't blow us up. What it does is it creates damage. And when it creates the damage, we start to make decisions based on the damage rather than what's going on in real time. So like you talked about, Joni, as a child, you had a certain type of teenage years. If you're not careful in your adult years, and it could have possibly happened, you'll start making decisions based on what happened to you as a teenager. And so I believe that once we gauge and get traction of what we've been through just like the dirt and the donkey it allows us to set up lives that are consistent with the path we want to go rather than the path that we came from you know what i mean and that's why i talked about being products of our thought lives i believe that we must be the driver of our cars and not the passenger of our cars And so if we're not in control of our thoughts and what we want to do in life, we become passengers, you know. Um, You know, I share a story of how, you know, my daughter came down one night and and it was before she was going to bed. She was four. And when she came down, you know, she came and got on my lap. And then when she went back to my wife, I said, good night, beautiful. And when I said that, she looked up at my wife and she did the happy dance. And she said, did you hear what he called me, mommy? He called me beautiful. But because of the work I do, I thought about it. And I thought about when she came down, if I would have been like, hey, didn't I tell you about bringing her down here when I'm watching football? You know, I was in my man cave and I was really loud. And then I, 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 I go over the fact that if I did this with her at four, five, six, seven, eight, and I take it up to whatever age group that I'm talking to. And then I ask, what does she look like? And so now you have to go there. If she's on the opposite end of those negative thoughts, she's dark. She's depressed. You know, she has poor relationship with boys because I'm her father and I represent boys or men. And then I finally asked the group, and I would ask you the same as who's driving a car. And I would be. Her dad would be driving a car. But what I want you guys to understand and the people that I work with to understand is that she can get married and have a husband and I can still drive a car. She can get married, have a husband and children. I still drive a car. And what people have to understand with these landmines and the damage is that if you don't take back your keys, you will be, like I started this statement, a passenger in your car rather than a driver. So, you know, those activities are are part of something that I teach uh, separate from the motivational things that I do. So I just wanted to download that on you guys. Well, that's been fantastic. I see Joni smiling. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Also, you're the king of analogies. So. Oh, I am. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. I got a new title. Thank you, Joni. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And 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 for both of you ladies, I have a book called Be Encouraged. Okay. So, you know, um we can put it in the show notes, Jennifer. Mm-hmm. Um, Definitely. for for your for your listeners, but if you go to uh shakethedirtexperience.com, you can get a free copy of the book. All right. Awesome. Yep, and it's it's written devotional style. 
Um, pick a page, read it. It motivates you for the day. Um, now that you spoke to me, it'll resonate a lot differently because you you know the man behind who wrote it. But I I think that it can really it can really help you out. You know what I'm saying? So um, I just want to put that out there. Yes. Well, that website will be hot linked in the show notes as well. Right. And I appreciate this. I hope this helped Joni because I know it helped yes. me. Yes, for sure. I had another aha moment when we moved. I got rid of a lot of my crafting paraphernalia stuff that I just moved from place to place and hung on to because you never know when you want to use it. And I didn't, and we purged a ton of stuff, which really felt good. So anybody's moving or even if you're not moving, purging crap out of your life feels really good. Um, stuff, not people. <laughs> and one of the things it's like, I need a creative outlet to help me through this insane time, this 2020 year. And I realized, well, I chose making cards for the residents and friends and family just because you use up the supplies, you get, you know, you're not cluttering up your house with stuff. And it's like, oh, I guess that's kind of a caregiver thing to do too. So apparently that is my role in life. <laughs> I kind wow. of feel like once a caregiver, always a caregiver. I, I, I truly feel that way. And it's, it's kind of funny because... Um, I used to work with a, an animal rescue in the middle of all of this stuff, you know, with my parents, you know, I, and then I moved them into a nursing home and my life did get a little bit easier, just in a different way. It wasn't so worrisome about them being at home. And I started fostering kittens and my husband was like, you don't have to take care of all the things. <laughs> yeah. I always say once a caregiver, always a caregiver. That is true. Well, I feel like I was, a caregiver before I became a caregiver for my mom and the caregiver to the caregivers with the podcast, but just in really subtle ways that you don't really think about, like with the cards, I don't consider that caregiving, but like my friend said, Oh, you want to make Halloween cards? Okay, great. I need five. But one of them, their family is extremely religious and it can't be Halloween. It has to be like harvest. And so mm -hmm. I made one and it says happy earth because I didn't have the, I don't have like the letters to punch out. I have words. So I took the happy holidays and the peace on earth and combined the two. And my husband's like, well, that might be seen as pagan. I'm like, whatever. I enjoyed making it hard. I will give it to one of the residents where mom lived. You know, it's all fine. You know, yeah. it's hanging over there. I get to enjoy it, but you know, it, and it saves my friend from running around trying to find four Halloween cards for four girls in this one non Halloween Halloween card for the one nephew. So it's like, it's been interesting. I really appreciate it, Michael and Joni. And I hope yes. this has helped other people who are feeling stuck, trapped, whatever kind of negative word we want to use. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Yeah. Yep, yep. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just, they could, they could come to, uh, michaelauderbury.com jennifer if they want to get get to me um for my public speaking um my nonprofit is uh youthvoicescenter.org and hopefully the both of you i think jennifer you're friends with me on facebook okay uh, one of those but yeah somewhere you, yeah 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 <laughs> facebook linkedin um oh linkedin you know, yeah yeah follow follow me um you know i'm very interactive with my followers and um you know definitely i would like to keep in touch with both you ladies so thank you for the opportunity jennifer you're welcome and jennifer if you have caregivers who are just starting out i i documented quite a bit of that on my instagram page i don't know if you want to link that on there yeah, i can um, do that yeah because i found that i i still i get messages every day about people who are just starting out on this journey and how it helps so it might be helpful to people just since they kind of know a little bit more about me Sounds terrific. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.